In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the most memorable experiences of my life, apart obviously from my stay here at St Mark's, was travelling in the Australian outback. At night it was pitch dark and I remember one particular night when there were no obstacles at all on the horizon. No hills, no rocks, no trees, nothing. Just flat sands in every direction. I lay down on my back and had the most extraordinary vision of the night sky. Wherever I looked as I lay there, if I looked down to my tiptoes, if I looked out to my fingertips, if I looked behind my head, the arc of the night sky rose around me as if rising up from the ground. And the brilliance of the heavenly lights in the darkness shone more brightly than I could ever have imagined. It was simply stunning, unforgettable. Well, of course, people have been marvelling at the night sky since time immemorial. The difference now, though, is that we know rather more about the cosmos than, say, the New Testament writers of 2,000 years ago. We no longer imagine a three-tier universe with heaven above, earth in the middle, and the underworld below. We know that up and down are relative terms in the great scheme of things. We know that the light of the stars that we see is already millions of years old. And we know that the universe is expanding at such a rate that the light from the most distant galaxies will simply never reach Earth so that we can never see to the edge of space. What all of this means, of course, is that on the basis of modern physics, even if Jesus had been a kind of primitive spaceman who took off from the earth 2,000 years ago and has been traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, for the last 2,000 years, it would still take him another 46 and a half billion years just to reach the edge of visible space, let alone the edge of the universe and whatever lies beyond that. This is not a very helpful way of thinking about the Ascension. <laughs> and I think that the New Testament writers knew that perfectly well. They knew that what they were dealing with was a mystery. And that the heart of the mystery was not how did Jesus go, but why did Jesus go? That's a big question. And I just want to suggest one angle of an answer. In our reading from Acts chapter 1, we heard that when the apostles had gathered together around the resurrected Jesus, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Poor Jesus. After all his explanations, even after the earth-shattering events of his death and resurrection, his followers still hadn't grasped the fact that his kingdom is not of this world. It must have felt like he was banging his head against a brick wall. What would it take to persuade the apostles that he was not going to be the anointed warrior king of Israel's ancient hope. Maybe the only answer was to disappear. Then their false hopes would have nothing to latch onto. The underlying problem here is, I think, idolatry. Through all of scripture, there's a constant battle against the worship of false images. 
Think of the first of the Ten Commandments, the first two. You shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make yourselves an idol. We know that in the ancient world, it was common for people to make material idols. Like the golden calf that Israel worshipped in the wilderness, which made Moses so angry that he smashed up the two stone tablets of the commandments and had to go and ask God for a replacement. <laughs> and there is no doubt, is there, that even today people worship material things, flashy cars, high-flying careers, bigger houses, famous people, special relationships, and so on. But there is another kind of idolatry, of false image worship, which is often harder to spot, though it is much more pernicious. I'm thinking about the temptation to make a God in our own image, to have a false idea of God, which is usually the idea that God likes the things that I like, and God doesn't like the things that I don't like. The idea of a God who fits in nicely with all of my preferences and prejudices. Such a God is very much my God, not, as this evening's psalm sang about, the Most High, the great King above all the earth, who sits above the nations upon his holy throne. This is what I think the apostles were doing in their own way. They were trying to domesticate Jesus, to make him fit within their limited sense of how things should be. I know it seems like a strange thought, but even when God becomes Emmanuel, God with us, God is still, still susceptible to idolization, to being reduced to something less than God really is, to a false image. People wanted Jesus to be the person people wanted him to be, not to be the person who he was. As I mulled this over, I was drawn to some words from today's gospel. While he was blessing them, Luke says, he withdrew from them. It reminded me of a line by the priest poet R.S. Thomas. Such a fast God, he wrote, always before us and leaving as we arrive. It's not that God is a sort of slippery character to speak like that as if God is deliberately trying to confuse us or elude us. The gospel links departing with blessing. The point is that we simply cannot grasp God, not truly and fully. And that if we try to grasp God, we end up with a false image. That's part of what we mean when we say that God is holy. Holiness is not just about moral correction, correctness or perfection. It's also about being set apart. Because God is holy, God is different. God is other. We might even say God is strange. And though we believe that God in Christ has drawn near, that nearness is not of a kind to reduce God's holiness, God's holy otherness. God in Christ is still God Almighty, not God Almighty. We cannot domesticate the Son of God and reduce him to something we find convenient or congenial. If Jesus had stayed, there would always have been a temptation in the church, an irresistible temptation to try and co-opt him to our pet projects. Do not 
hold on to me, he said to Mary Magdalene in the garden on Easter morning, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. Now that Christ is in glory, we cannot so easily get hold of him, to manipulate him or tie him down to suit our ends. Unlike the apostles, we are unlikely to want Jesus to be our anointed warrior king, but every place and every age has its own idols, and Jesus will have none of them. He will not be a god in our own image. So the ascension of Jesus gives us a proper perspective on his holy otherness. Though he is one with us, he is not simply like us. And let's thank God for that, because the last thing that the world needs is to worship man writ large. What the world needs is to be turned upside down and inside out. For the kingdom of heaven will not be built by human hands or according to human standards. God has something far better in mind for us than we could ever imagine. And the ascension lifts our eyes from the mundane to the transcendent. And as we heard in the letter to the Ephesians, it opens us up to the riches of Christ's glorious inheritance among the saints, to the immeasurable greatness of his power, to the fullness of him who fills all in all. In the light of that great vision and promise, even our greatest schemes must surely fade away. So, tonight, let us clear out the sanctuary of our minds. Let's cast out the man-made idols, the false images, the devices and desires of our own foolish hearts, and let's glorify the risen and ascended Christ. Because if we can enthrone him in our lives as he is enthroned in heaven, then I believe he can accomplish abundantly far more than all we could ever ask or even imagine. Thanks be to God. Amen.